Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, you know, I used the analogy earlier today because uh, I have a dirty garage, but if, if you're going to try and clean it, you start somewhere. You start in that corner. I think that's what we're talking about here, too. I mean, we've got a massive behemoth government, and there's all kinds of waste and inefficiency, but you have to start somewhere and utilize those examples across the board then. Uh, I just wanted to ask a couple follow-up questions on the properties. When you're, uh, Mr. Zients, when you're talking about $15 billion savings over three years, is that savings in, in the cost of running those properties, or is that just receipts from selling the property? Both. So we have properties that are abandoned that might not be, have much market value. Those we have to either give away or demolish and save the maintenance and energy costs. Um, the majority of the savings, I think it's about 60 to 65 uh, percent, is in the sale. But the other 35 percent, obviously, is important maintenance and energy costs. Do you have an estimate, this is maybe getting a little off subject, but do you have an estimate of, of total property, what the total receipt might be if we sold it? I mean, of, of, uh, of, it's, of, carried on, it's carried in the books at, uh, over a trillion dollars, but the book value is a funny number here, um, given the market fluctuations where some are probably worth this and some are worth much more than we carried on, book, on the book. I think the figure is high, high one point something trillion. It's $20 billion a year of maintenance um, and energy expense. So that's our annual expense. Again, so you can save maintenance the and you could have money coming to the Treasury to fill a budget gap. Exactly. Uh, Mr. Dare, you're talking about uh, oversight hearings. I mean, one thing I've learned in business is I've generally got better results trying to be positive. But when that fails, I think you have to get negative. Can, can you just talk to me a little bit about how you'd envision those uh, oversight hearings? I mean, I would imagine, again, talking about that corner of the garage, you'd try and use examples, correct, to highlight it, and then maybe other agencies would uh, start towing the line? I, I think, uh, you know, I'd use an example of one area, the two areas that came off the high-risk list. First was the personnel security clearances. It was taking a huge amount of time, months, uh, right after 9-11 to get people their security clearances. So we put on a high-risk list. Congress imposed some metrics, OMB, Jeff, and uh, OPM, uh, and DOD got involved, and they brought that metric down uh, over time to less than 60 days to process the original clearance. There was clear metrics. Congress had discussions. It was a constructive process. Uh, same thing happened with the decennial census. Uh, that got off track for this last 2010 census. We put it on the high-risk list in March 2008 out of our normal two-year cycle because we were concerned. Uh, we gave a lot of specific recommendations. Commerce got involved, the Congress got involved, Senator Carper and this, this uh, committee. Uh, a lot of hearings were held. They brought it down on track. An IT project was out of control on these handheld devices, and they were able to do it. So my belief is, and I've participated in a lot of oversight hearings over the years, that I think with, when there are clear priority goals, clear metrics, Congress can play a very constructive role in keeping the agency on track. And this is particularly important because of the lack of continuity issue that might occur in the executive branch, both within administrations and across administrations. And that's why our high-risk list, we maintain it since 1990 across administrations so that we can you know, keep the focus on trying to move forward in these areas. So it's a, it's a very positive thing, uh, and it could f focus on you know, accomplishments in terms of, of achieving results. Uh, for example, Senator Voinovich w was said he would originally come back from Florida from vacation if we took the personnel security clearances off the high-risk list. Uh, ultimately decided the weather was better in Florida than it was here. But, uh, uh, but I, I think uh, those things can, can, can happen. So those are just two examples. I could give you more. Okay. We, we talked a little bit earlier about congressional action. Uh, would either of you envision with either of your agencies recommending for sunset certain programs, you know, a list of, you know, that Congress can, could then act on? I mean, is, is that kind of in the offing? Yeah, I, I think the, the Modernization Act calls for OMB uh, after uh, areas do not meet their programs, don't meet their goals over a three, you know, like a three-year period to recommend termination, you know, redefining or some other action. So that concept is built into the Modernization Act. I think that's healthy. Uh, I think there are normal reauthorizations that are supposed to occur already in programs, whether they be at FAA or, or other areas, but they're, they're typically postponed. Uh, you know, No Child Left Behind, for example, is up for reauthorization. Head Start programs. So I, I think that the idea of regular reviews is a really good idea. It's a healthy idea. 
and it ought to be uh, implemented effectively. The, the President each year in his budget puts forward terminations and reductions as a separate volume. Last year, or for the FY 2012 budget, it was th over $33 billion in 200 different programs. Now, some of those have been on the list for quite some time, going across different administrations. Um, but uh, we would imagine those efforts ramping up even further in this fiscal environment. And the federal cross-agency goals that the Act calls for will certainly be in these areas of duplication and overlap. And we would envision um, finding programs uh, that are less effective that either need to be turned around or terminated as part of that effort. I mean, just, it's just a basic estimate. How many of those programs need congressional action versus just that could be terminated by the agencies themselves? I think the most, the vast majority of them need congressional action. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Okay, so we need those lists. Yeah. Um, you, t you talked about cross-agency action. Uh, is there any kind of clearinghouse for just best practice methods uh, within government? Of, yeah. Acro across the management sphere? Yes. Um, and that, that actually is something I'm a big believer in. My private sector work was sort of centered around best practices, the basic theory being that some executives or some organizations are further ahead on certain issues and others can benefit from that. We, the senior most body, the President's Management Council that I talked about earlier, uh, is a clearinghouse for best practices at the senior most level. We have councils in each of the functional areas. So there's a Chief Acquisition Officer Council, a CFO Council, a Chief Human Capital Council, and so on across the major functional areas. And we've really ensured that those become primarily best practice clearinghouses. What's working, what's not working, how can we work together more efficiently? How, how, I was going to say, how well are those utilized? I think increasingly well. I and mean, that's been one of our priorities. Not, you know, there, there's some variability. Um, the way that we've uh, tried to make sure those councils have a high return is to ensure that the senior most people are there. And in order to get the senior most people there, you have to have agendas that matter. And we have found that the sharing of best practices on important issues with real granularity and analytics to support them is the way to get people there and to find that the, that the council is a good return on their time. Mr. I, I cut you off. I'm sorry. No, no that, uh, that's fine, Senator. Uh, uh, I would say the, the functional councils and the sharing best practices work uh, pretty good. They can be better, and we've made some recommendations. Uh, but where there is not really good uh, processes in place are in individual program areas. Like, for example, we find in our report on overlap and duplication, there were 82 programs focused on improving teacher quality across 10 different agencies. And there really was no process there to coordinate. There are, you know, multiple programs trying to provide assistance to the disabled. Uh, and there's no real regular form for that. So when these, you know, individual programs by agencies, there needs to be more of a focus. Now, the Modernization Act requires either OMB to designate a few cross-cutting goals, but it also requires now agencies to identify for their programs who else they should be coordinating with. And so if that part can be implemented effectively, I think you can have a more comprehensive approach to coordination that would ferret out a lot of this overlap and duplication uh, by having a dialogue within the executive branch itself.